Hi, I'm Resham Arden and welcome to the Now I Know podcast where we educate our audience on wellbeing topics. With me today is Ekim, who you may know on Instagram as Body by Ekim. Welcome Ekim. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh no, thank you so much for coming. Um, for the audience listening, I wanted to know how we connected. So when I first decided to do the podcast, my first guest was Dr. Rina Bajaj. And when she saw the podcast and what it was about, about well-being and changing stigmas and taboos, the first thing she said to me was, you have to meet Ekam <laughs> and you have to have her as a guest. Um, and then obviously we've spoken. And yeah. then, you know, one of the questions you said to me was, are you doing this virtual or in person? And I was like, I'm doing it all virtual. And you're like, there's a studio I yeah. was like, near you. And so I thank you for the studio, because <laughs> if it wasn't okay. for you, I would not have been in the studio. So thank We're you so much. We're not here to gatekeep. We're happy to share. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. For the audience, let them know who is Ekam. So I am a Indian female bodybuilder. I am an online coach with a team of three to four. I have personal trainers who work in our private studio in Uxbridge, and I do online coaching where I work with women around the world. And on the side of that, like I said, I do bodybuilding. I'm currently in my third season of competing. So anything fitness, well-being, I'm all about. Um, and what we try to educate our clients on is, you know, their physical health, but they're linked with that and their mental health. Wow, not many people can say Indian female bodybuilder. I know, it's a lot of words. So I was like, wow. Even my daughter, when I told her to meet, she was like, wow. Like, So that's the question I'd love to ask you. Tell me your journey of how you got into bodybuilding. So to be honest, I was in uni and as most of us do at uni, I gained a lot of weight, loads of takeaways, loads of nights out. And I got to a point that I was really unhappy in myself, just really insecure. My self-esteem was low. It was taking an impact on when I was drinking. Every time I would drink, I would just feel sad and depressed. So I knew something needed to change. And in my final year of uni, I decided to get on top of my fitness and I took my friend with me and we started going to the gym and I just kind of made a routine. I started using my fitness pal. I just researched a little bit and I got into it and that carried on from uni to my first uh, corporate job after uni. And as I got deeper into my fitness journey, I started to learn more about bodybuilding. Naturally, as you do, loads of personal trainers are bodybuilders. You see a lot of stuff on social media. My friend at uni also knew about it. So she's the one who kind of first introduced me into it. And I, I also dated someone who was doing bodybuilding at the time. So I had snippets of what it was like, but I was also very far from it. And it was never something that I thought about doing. And as I got deeper on my fitness journey and I, I was losing a lot of weight and then I left my job to take PT full time, it just seemed more and more like something I really wanted to do. Like it was this goal. I wanted to hit something that I would be so proud of. And actually because of COVID, I competed. Um, so mm -hmm. if it wasn't for COVID, I, I, who knows where things would have gone. But I think COVID hit and I got to a point in my physique and I said to my coach, you know, I would love to try it. And I told myself, if I can do a prep and I can compete and go on stage, that is the best accomplishment I have done in my whole life. Uh, more than my degree at uni or whatever else, because I know what it takes to compete. And it is such um, a battle mentally, physically, like you have to be so strong. And I wanted to test and challenge myself. And I've always been someone who... I like to practice what I preach to my clients. I just feel like how can my clients respect me if I'm not doing what I'm telling them to do when it comes to discipline and habit building and things like that. So in 2020, I did my first prep and did my show. So I kind of fell into bodybuilding very naturally with time. I think I was four years deep into my journey and also a personal trainer at that point when I decided to step into bodybuilding and there was never a plan to do more than one show. Um, but I did my first show and it was a three month prep. And I stepped off stage and I was like, I need to do this again. I need oh, to wow. beat this package. I actually wasn't really happy with how I placed. Um, I didn't, as my first show, I, I think there's a competitor inside me that wanted to do well, as well as having this goal of just even stepping on stage. So when I did that show and I didn't play, I think I placed like six out of seven people in my category, I just stepped away and I just said, nope, I need to do it again. I need to do better. And then it just kind of went from there and it just kept happening. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, and it's, you know what? I do love it. It's taught me a lot about myself. It's taught me a lot about my coaching methods. It's helped me understand people around my life better. Um, 
but it isn't for the faint hearted. It is really, really tough. You said like three months prep. Like, what does that look like? So your prep um, will be a specific diet plan, a meal plan, um, and you have to stick to it. There's no off plan meals. Um, and it's like your four, five, six meals, have a meals you have in a day and you have to eat that every day. You could maybe change certain foods, but the deeper you get into your prep, so the closer you get to show, it gets more strict. So you can't change your foods the closer you get to it. It has to be very consistent variables. And alongside that, you have your training plan that you have to follow. You can't miss any training sessions. You need to make sure you're pushing yourself as hard as possible. And on top of that, you'll have your cardio. So however much cardio you're supposed to be doing on your prep. In that first season, I was doing an hour every day. So I would do like 30 minutes of on the Stairmaster and 30 minutes of skipping. And then I would also do my weight session with that and then have my food. And then on top of that, you also have a step count of how many steps you need to be hitting every day. Um, so like right now, my step count is like, 14,500. <laughs> so there's a lot that goes into a prep. It's your food, your training, your cardio, your steps, um, ticking the daily boxes, really. So, you know, we, we were talking about that when you came in and you, you were saying how, like, the hunger kicks in as well, doesn't it? So apart from the hunger challenge, what what else? Like, have you ever dropped off that prep when you first did it? Because that's, that's intense, isn't it? Um, No, I, I owed... Prep is the only thing that I can do where I am so, so disciplined. And I don't expect any of my clients who are lifestyle clients to do the same thing. Um, it's more so like I want to show people and my clients, this is what you can achieve when you give 100%. But real life gets in the way and no one really needs to give 100% when they're just a lifestyle client. It's just giving 70, 80%. So I like to show people this is what you can achieve, but you can also achieve good results with an off-plan meal every week and whatever it may be. But one thing I would say is, I pride myself on the fact that I've never really fallen off track with it. I think in my head, I think to myself, I'm stepping on stage in front of all these people. And if I don't win, I can only blame myself. If I have one cookie, one bite, one drink, I'm going to think of all those times I wasn't on plan and be so angry at myself thinking it's my fault. I didn't win. However, if I've given 100%, I know I have, and then I don't win, that's out of my control. Like yeah. the, the sport is very subjective. That's what kind of pushes me to not really fall off track. Yeah. And obviously with each prep that I've done, it's gotten, I've become more disciplined. I've become more regimented because practice makes perfect. Yeah. So, you know, my first prep was three months. Um, and last my last season and this season, my prep will be seven months. Wow. So you need more time on to prep. Three months yeah. is really enough. And that's what I learned from my first season. Mm. So a lot of trial and error still. Um, but it just shows the longer you are on this journey, even if you're just a lifestyle client, it you do improve over time. Yeah. You just have to be patient and consistent. And I love what you did there. You set yourself a goal. And once you reached it, you're like, what, what do I need to do differently next time? And that's really what like growth mindset's all about, self-development. And that's amazing. Yeah, it was, I think it was funny because I remember stepping off the stage on my first show and everyone was like oh my god like hugging me kissing me and stuff and I was just there like really angry and they were like what's wrong and I was like I did crap I did oh. crap like I did I went thinking I was going to do somewhat well and I just didn't place where I thought and it just created this like burning desire to be like nope I'm not done yet like I need to come back and do it better so then I competed again in 2021 and like really massively improved my physique um and placed much higher. And that was definitely, it took more out of me. Um, and that's why I took last year off competing to have balance and enjoy life and take, give back to family and friends for all the times I sacrificed. Um, but you have to, it, it, it honestly is person dependent on what you're like as a person. I didn't know how I would feel stepping off stage that first time. In my head, I just told myself I wanted to do it once. But the person you are, that growth mindset, I think I'm someone who is never really content. So every time I've done something, it's kind of like, okay, what now? Um, which I love about myself. And that's one thing I pride myself in. And I think having that mindset is really important in terms of becoming the best version of you, which is what I always push my clients to be. You know, you mentioned that you're at university and then you wonder, you're like, right, we're just going to go to the gym. I know loads of people that want that they just make excuses so what was the difference with you to just say I'm just gonna go and do this I actually had a loved one have a really hard conversation with me and basically say to me you're unhealthy um and you know you're not fit and it's a really awkward conversation to have to basically say to someone you love especially when it's like a partner or like not not really maybe your mum or dad but someone that you obviously respect and you have a close relationship with 
um, to basically sit you down and say, you know, you, you can't breathe right when you're going up the stairs, you know, you are, you know, you're not eating right, you're not making good choices, you're, you're not keeping fit and healthy. And it's horrible to hear that, but it was the push I needed to think, oh my God, like, I don't want to be that person. You don't realize in yourself how you're coming across. Yeah. So it takes someone having to have an awkward and difficult conversation with you for it to click. And that won't work for everyone, but it worked for me where I was like, I don't want to be this person because I was already insecure in myself. But sometimes I think we get comfortable sitting with those insecurities. Yeah. We want to change, but we also are comfortable in what we're doing. And to, to make that change is scary and uncomfortable. So we kind of sit with being unhappy. Yeah. Um, so that conversation is what led me to be like, I got to do something. And having a friend and going to the gym with her helped. And it was a very slow start. Like I made loads of mistakes along the way because I was doing it a lot myself. Um, and that's why I always recommend investing in a coach because I've been able to learn and grow so much from having coaches mm. guide me. Um, I know a lot of people tried to their journeys themselves. I did the same thing. But now all the mistakes I made along the way, I can ensure my clients don't make those same mistakes, yeah. which means they have a smoother journey and process, which makes you feel more motivated. Mm -hmm. You spend six weeks thinking you're doing something right, your weight doesn't budge, you give up. Yeah. But you're not gonna have the tools and knowledge or resources to even know how to do it correctly. Yeah. You know, it's like, let's say the field that you have expertise in in your current job, that's like me coming in and saying, like, I'm going to do the same thing. I don't know anything about it, but yeah. you will. So I will come to you and say, hey, I need help. Like, how do I do this, this, this? Or I want to get a job in your industry. Mm. What do I do? Yeah. Uh, and you're going to explain it to me. So I'm going to use that guidance. Whereas if I just went in knowing nothing, was like, right, I'm going to apply for this role. It's going to make no sense. Yeah, absolutely. Like mentoring, coaching, like just someone who can guide you. And I think another thing you have as well is you've been there. You've been in that low point where someone's mm. had to sort of like, like an intervention, isn't it? And say like, yeah. you need to fix up, Ekim. Yeah, you know? that's literally what it is. It's an intervention. And I think if the right person says it to you, you're not going to like it. You're going to feel probably crap. You're probably going to cry about it. But if you have a good head on your shoulders and you're just, and it's not like you will instantly be that person, but if you want to be the best version of yourself, you want to be self-aware, you want to improve, you will try to find something in you that will think, you know what, there was that was horrible, but they have a point. And I want to change. Mm. And maybe that'll give me the reason to change now. Yeah. You must be so grateful for that conversation. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I would, I, I've not even had that conversation with anyone. Like, it's not like I've got any friends or family or someone that I've had to have that conversation with them. So I can't even say I know what it feels like to be on the opposite end. But if there was ever someone in my life that I felt like I need to have that conversation, or if you feel like there's someone in your life and you need to give them that intervention, like, you can do it. Yeah. They may not take it in, um, but the fact that you did it shows you care. Totally. I've got a lot of friends who are in that space where they really want to change. They don't know how. And I keep saying, look, just get yourself an accountability partner, yeah. a personal trainer. Um, and then it's not just getting to the gym. It's also the food, isn't it? And then the prep. It and is you do lots of uh, like advice on recipes and stuff, don't you? Yeah. Like, you know, they say you can't outrun a bad diet. So your nutrition is 80%. Um, and it is tough. Obviously, I've been doing this since 2016. So I've built myself up to this point where I think for a lot of women, and this is where it gets tougher because especially as just South Asian women, but just women in general, we have a different relationship to food than men do. So we look at food for comfort. We look at food for happiness. If we're stressed, we want to eat. If we're sad, we want to eat. I've done it. I've like broken up with someone and then like ate tubs of ice cream afterwards and gained weight. Like it's just comfort. It's comforting. And that's what we strive for. But I think if you can learn to find comfort and enjoyment in other things outside of food, you will realize that yes, food can bring you happiness and please you, but there are times in life where you've got to find that happiness from somewhere else. Yeah. And I think that's what it is. People just, you know, women love food and like, I, I'm a foodie, I'm a big foodie. I can, I can eat, but the difference is I know when to, and I know when not to. Yeah. I feel like now as well, like when I started my journey in 2016, it was so tough because there weren't a lot of resources around. Now you got all these vegan protein options. You have all these sugar-free, calorie-free syrups and foods and low calorie drinks. Like there's so many things out there food-wise to make your journey so much easier. Yeah. It is, now is the easiest time ever to lose weight, honestly. Um, compared to what it was like when I first started. I, I had to make so many mistakes. Um, but I think that's why it's good to have a coach because as women, we struggle. Like I've been there where I'll come home from work and my food is there and my food, I'll put my meal prep in the microwave. But during those two minutes in the microwave, I'll eat five biscuits mm. and I won't even realize 
what I've done. Like it's like it's uh, like you're just not there in the moment and you'll eat one and before you know it, you've had five and you're like, how did I even do that? Like I just, you weren't even mentally present. Yeah. And so I've been there where my relationship with food hasn't been great. Um, and for a lot of women, that's the case. And I think that you have to work with a coach, work on that aspect to then, you, you can't lose weight and have, without having a healthy relationship with food. Yeah. They have to work hand in hand. Otherwise you can follow a plan for 12 weeks, but then as soon as you finish, you go back to your normal ways, the weight goes back up. Yeah. Same way as a lot of women will do like Slimming World or Weight Watchers or Herbalife Life or whatever these kind of supplement or these brands are that help you lose weight. As soon as you go back to real life yeah. and you eat normal foods or whatever it is, the weight comes back up. But what you yeah. have to do is find the lifestyle you enjoy and implement new habits and ways into that lifestyle. So it's a mix and a blend, like hybrid, you yeah, know, totally. that that is the best way. Um, and we do help clients a lot. Like we've got recipe books that have calories available. I'm currently working on trying to make an Indian recipe book with calories so that we can make it easier for our clients to enjoy their favorite foods. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, and I will say this to myself and a lot of my, a lot of my clients, food is always going to be there it's never running away mm. you, like that mcdonald's will, that samosa will always be there <laughs> like always yeah so you have to ask yourself in that moment do i want this right now or can i have this in like two weeks or yeah. whenever mm. like is there is there going to be a day where there will never be any more indian food ever again no yeah it's just realizing in that moment your emotion and the food is controlling you and you need to take a step back and think no i want control yeah food controls a lot of us without realizing it. Yeah. You have to take a step back. And that process of learning and thinking and acting um, takes time to implement. Yeah. You know, you talk about food and South Asian culture. Um, I remember seeing a post on your Instagram one day about, you know, people wanting to have to take their own food to like dinner parties because they can't eat the things that are being there. So tell me a bit more about f like culturally and food and how it can impact someone training. I mean, for myself, like I grew up and like had Indian food most of my upbringing growing up and I never like, thought twice about it. But because of that, I never really had a lot of normal English foods, which meant I didn't probably eat a lot of vegetables growing up. It was just like dal and rice and all that kind of stuff. And as I got older and I got started my weight loss journey, I realized how hard it was. So I slowly started to cut out the Indian food. And for me personally, I don't eat a lot of it now out of pure preference, not, mm -hmm. because, not because like by force. And what I tend to say to a lot of clients is start your journey, sacrifice short term, you know, just put it on pause with the Indian food until you start seeing results. Mm -hmm. When you start seeing results and you find your routine and your momentum, you can slowly add the Indian foods in. Like it's, I know it's tough. Some people can't say no to their mom's food and stuff, but you have to realize, are you living for yourself or are you living for someone else? Because yeah. you can stay in the body and please everyone else, but be so unhappy in the body you're in. Mm. Or you can set some boundaries, put yourself first, and then in time, give back to others. Yeah. Um, I've, I've missed a lot of things. I've missed my mom's birthday. I've missed family dinners. And it's tough. But then I give back in the times that I can. Like all of last year was my time to give back to all my family and friends on occasions like that. Um, and like I said, Indian food will always be there. I think it's alongside this journey of making right decisions. And with the Indian food, there's an element of setting your boundaries, which isn't easy and takes practice as well. But it's just very inconsistent. I think there are ways to implement Indian food into the diet. But when you're a newbie to your journey and you're trying to work out, you're trying to meal prep, let's say you're a mum, or let's say you have a partner or you're a wife or you have kids, you have so much on your plate. Yeah. Do you really want to add to that stress by tracking all the ingredients in your Indian recipes and, and then trying to divide it by X amount of portions and, and like take that stress away temporarily. Yeah. And maybe you can't have your favorite Indian dish for like a few weeks or like one or two months. But when you do have it, after you get the results, like it will feel so much nicer. Yeah. And probably more tasty. Yeah, and, and it, what what you reminded me of, you know, like going to your mum's, like you had to miss a few things. Or like, I remember when uh, my brother went vegan years ago when it wasn't really a thing. And it, it would stress my mum out. Like, mm. what do I make him? And I remember a few years later, I met a friend and she was going into veganism and she said, my mum just doesn't know what to make. And she said to her mum, like, you know, you can just make me like chole pudure without... Mm. Um, 
using milk, you know, and that and the mum's like, oh, but and it, we have to educate others yeah. as well, isn't it? Otherwise, we're, we're making enough sacrifices through the programme, let alone we don't want to then miss out on the social side as well. It, it's hard and you have to really have some... I think if you really want this long term and you really want to change yourself, you have to sit and put time out to have those conversations, sit your your family down, sit your mum down and be like, mum, I'm doing this journey and I, I, it's I, like, you're not going to understand it, but like, I just, I, this is what I can and can't do. And I get it's super tough. Um, but it's also how you respect your journey. Mm. I think there's a lot of people who, for example, there, there's two scenarios. You could be someone who starts your journey. You have a coach. You don't tell anyone. You're just going to the gym. You know, no one knows you, you started this journey. You don't talk about it. You know, they ask you to go out. You don't know what to say. You feel pressured and you're just a bit to yourself about it, right? How is anyone going to respect your decisions, respect your journey or understand it when you can't talk about it? Yeah. Or the scenario two is you are super pumped and excited to start your journey. You've got your coach. You're telling all your friends, I've got this journey, I've got this coach, I'm starting this diet and I'm so excited, guys. And that means I can't go out, but like, bear with me on this. Like, I need your lot of support because it's going to be tough, but I'm so excited to change. Like, I'm so sick of feeling yeah. like this. And the more excited you are about this journey, the more respect you put on it, the more people are going to respect it. But if you don't respect your own journey enough mm. to give it that priority, no one else is. Yeah, totally. You have to put it first. You have to talk about it positively. You have to express yourself. If you're going to sit quietly about your journey and not talk about it, I know some people like to be very low key with it, but people around you need to know. Yeah. They need to understand how can anyone respect it then? Yeah. Um, and something that I did all of last year and even earlier this year, is anyone, especially anyone new I met in my life, I was like, a whole different person last year. I was like, going out, enjoying life. <laughs> and I just said to them, I was like, when I start prep, it's different. It's a different ikum. When I start prep, when I go into prep, when this happens on prep, and like, I just kept going on about it and on about it to the point where even I put pressure on myself to be like, I have to smash this prep because I've told everyone about it. Mm -hmm. So I've made it very clear from the set get go with a lot of people, relationships even, this is what I've got. And it's a really big thing to me and it's going to change everything. Yeah. Um, even even with my partner, like I told him very early on, you know, I, I'm a bodybuilder and I do this prep and like, I can't drink alcohol. I can't go for dinner. I can't do any of these things. Um, I'm going to get moody. I'm going to get hungry. I'm just letting you know now what's going to happen <laughs> so you're aware. And because I'm setting those boundaries and making people aware and having those communication, like those conversations, they can't have a go at me. They yeah. can't say anything to me. I've made it very clear. Yeah. And if you can do the same and you say to your partner, babe, I'm starting this journey with this coach. It's 12 weeks long. Like, I really, really want to smash it. Like, it means a lot to me. I want to change. I want to give it 100%. Please, can we, like, not go for dinner over the next 12 weeks? Can we make home-cooked foods? Can we go places where calories are available and menus? Like, if you're letting them know, yeah. then if they don't respect it after that, that's a whole different situation. Yeah, absolutely. You, you've, you've laid your cards on the tables. This is what you're signing up to. Exactly. You know? Absolutely. So, you know... um, a lot of it sounds like mindset and I know you do like monthly mind well-being things with your clients like give, give us an example of the sort of topics you talk about in your monthly calls so we do monthly mental health zoom sessions with uh, Dr Rena and we cover different topics completely every month so some of the topics we've covered is boundaries self-care stress emotional eating trauma because what we find is in everyday life while you're doing this journey there's something that's going to like life is not linear this journey is not linear something's going to throw its way in like and throw a spanner in the works like it's so normal mm -hmm. so you need to understand your triggers and you need to understand okay if I've got a stressful moment in work right now and work is really stressing me out and I'm coming home and I want to I'm craving something wait let me what does that mean like what's going on here let me be aware of what I'm about to do because I'm stressed at work and now I want to go home and binge eat yeah so what's happening here so we're having these conversations with our clients to help them understand the reason why you binged, like you binged on food last night is because you came home from work, you didn't have your meal prep sorted, you're stressed out at work and because you're stressed, you're resorting to food for comfort, you need to find some other source of comfort. Or how are you managing your stress? Mm. Are you doing the right things to manage it? There's physical techniques, there's mental techniques to manage it. So finding ways to help them through these solutions and something that I'm so big on this year um, that we spoke about at our workshop we did a few months ago with our clients is boundaries. Yeah. Setting those boundaries to make sure you have a healthier and happier journey and also understanding what kind of boundaries, um, who you need to set them with. It plays a massive role in you actually honestly being happier in yourself. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I love that community because um, I w- saw an episode on a podcast with Jay Shetty, a guy called Dr. Mark Hyman, and he was talking about changing habits and you need a community. So what you've got is an amazing community of everyone helping each other. So when someone is falling off, they've got someone to reach out to, isn't it? That gets their journey. They understand them. Exactly. And I think the thing is, it's hard because you could be two types of people. You could be someone who is good at communicating and will message your coach and say, I've fallen off. I've had like five glasses of wine, I've had a bag of crisps, like I'm just struggling. Or you may be someone who becomes avoidant and you then don't talk, you don't check in, you don't speak to your coach. And again, that's a negative way to deal with it. And that's something we talk to clients about as well is like the type of person you are, your boundaries. Are you someone that can have a secure relationship where you can talk to someone when you need them compared to, because a lot of people are quite avoidant. So they will just run away from it because they don't know how to confront it. So even having those conversations with clients to be like, don't miss your check-in, you know, come talk to us and let us know. If you've had a bad week, that's the most important week to check Mm. in. But setting that to clients regularly and letting them know this this is how it is takes time. Yeah. Um, And everyone is so different. And I think when you're a coach, it's honestly about how you manage people. Yeah. Um, And managing people is, is the hardest thing to do. Absolutely. You have to be very adaptable. So there's never like one rule for a client. Depending on what cli- each client is like, it's very different and everyone is so different. Mm. Um, but I've been doing this for a few years now and I see how different people are. And the one thing is we have our app now. So when like, someone misses a check-in, they get a notification to be like, you've missed your check-in. Right. So it's that extra level of accountability where they get this message on their phone and they're like, oh, wow. yeah, you know. So we try to find ways to help push them and give them more, whether it's me reaching out to them, whether it's a notification on their phone, whether it's like phone calls here and there for support. Yeah. But everyone is so different with it. You have to really understand a client and adapt to them if you want them to get the results. It's really interesting. While you're talking about, I'm thinking of someone who might not check in because they've fallen off the program or whatever they were set to do. Do you think that's like they've just got fear of being judged? Maybe there's a fear of judgment, but then I think that comes down to you have to have good communication and tell me as your coach, you know, I'm scared. I I, like I messed up. Um, And then obviously I would say it's fine. These things happen. Like the the thing is some people love tough love and some people don't. Yes. So I've had to find through coaching is there are people that I have to say to them, listen, you're messing up. You're not on it. Like straight up, you're not going to get the results and you've got all the tools to get the results. So you can only blame yourself. And they're like, no, thank you. I needed that so much. But if I do that to the wrong client, they're going to, retract and they're gonna and I've had clients saying to me that just kind of made me feel worse and and I, that's not the kind of way I need it so then I have to change my approach and say to them okay what's up what do you need yeah. you know okay let's go it this way let's do it this way like it's okay that you fell off it's fine and the thing is you really have to and it takes time and I think a lot of people especially when they have a coach they just want to rush the journey and you have to understand that a coach needs to work with you for a good amount of time to understand you yeah in order to then understand your body in order to get the results so you're prepping for your next competition. When is that? So my my first show this season is in two weeks wow. on the 24th of September. And then I've got quite a few shows. I've got a show four weeks later from there and then shows every two weeks leading up to the 9th of December. So wow. this is where the fun begins, but I am tired. Because yeah. <laughs> not only are you doing all this meal prep and training, but I've seen on your Instagram page, you're even having to like, is there like a style to walk? And you're yeah. doing like, it's like a, it looks like a fashion show catwalk. You're learning a way <laughs> to walk and stand. It's hard. It's hard. So obviously we have to do certain poses on stage to show off our physique it's very aesthetic based it's not really matter it doesn't matter what you weigh or how hard you worked they don't care it's just who who looks the best on stage on the day um so it's a tough sport in that sense um and it's hard because the posing is you're basically tensing all your muscles at once yes. and you're holding that pose. And even when you're walking, you've got to tense your abs. You've got to keep your chest up. You've got to keep your bum up. You've got to do all these things. And, it's, and at the same time, you have to smile alongside oh it. God. So it's a lot. But um, obviously, as my third season, it's it's all right. It's and no, no prep is the same. Yeah. No prep is the same. This prep is very different to two years ago. But I feel like I'm a different person to who I was two years ago. Yeah. So it's so hard to compare. Um, but it's great this time around I have, so our, one of our trainers in the studio, Holly, she's prepped, this is her first season ever. So it's her first show, but we're doing about three shows together. Oh, that's lovely. So it's so nice to prep with someone. We're like there supporting each other. We had like a one hour phone call yesterday because she 
had a wobble in her head about how she was getting on. So I was there reassuring her. I've had wobbles on the prep and she's been there reassuring me. So it's really nice having people in your corner supporting you. Yeah. Those who understand, like I don't think I've really had anyone so close to me who actually understood what I was going through. Yeah. My last two preps, I was very much alone. My yes. friends were there, but they're not going to understand. Yeah. Whereas where she's doing it with me, we have the same mindset, yeah. the same issues, the same struggles. So it, it definitely makes a difference. But it's it's my last season competing, actually. Um, what's, what's made you say that? Prep takes a lot out of you. I'm going to be 29 uh, in a few months' time in Jan. And, you know, every time I prep, it's seven months out of the year. Right. That's a lot you miss out on. And I feel like three seasons is a good amount. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty happy with that. And I'm ready to strive for balance. I want to change my training. I want to intuitively eat. I want to do the things that I basically get my clients to do, but I don't because I bodybuild. Right. It's a very restrictive um, sport. Mm -hmm. I do love it, but I'm ready to just look at the next chapter in life, find some balance and be able to do more. Yeah. But the stage is always there. So for the foreseeable future, I won't be compete, competing after this year. But I mean, never say never. Yeah, I might come back when I'm a mum. Yes, who knows? <laughs> you get loads of bodybuilders who are mums yeah, who, wow. who step on stage. So it's definitely it's definitely in my head. Wow. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah. Stay in touch. And the see comeback. The next, yeah. <laughs> round two. Um, but speaking of mums, I, I was talking to my daughter yesterday. I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to finally meet Eka. We've been yeah. for months. And she was like, wow. And I said to my daughter, if there's one question, because she was looking at your Instagram page, I said, if there's one question you'd ask Eka, what would it be? And it was really interesting. She was looking at it and she was just like, why do they have to wear that colour? You know, they yeah. put like a brown colour on Tan. you. Tan. What is that for? So when you're on stage... You're obviously very lean, you've been dieting. However, when you get spray tans, it accentuates certain aspects of your body. Right. And especially when you're under very strong lighting on stage, it washes you out. So you need to be tanned in order to actually show the judges your physique. Right. If I just went on stage in my normal skin color now, I will be very washed out because the lights are so bright. Right. So I have to be darker. It will then like show lines in my abs, show like striations in my legs. So the tan is there to actually help you present your best package on stage. Oh, Everyone has to have a tan. Um, you basically get a tan the night before your show and then you get another tan on the day of your show and you can't shower. So everyone who competes, they haven't showered that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah. It, was, it was interesting to hear. Because I didn't even actually... Wondered that, and although she was just like, and it comes brown, so would she? Have yeah. to do it? You know what? I have to say, I do love a good spray tan. I only ever do it when I'm competing. But if I was to go and tan right now, I don't go nice and golden. I probably burn if anything. <laughs> yeah. um, so when I get a spray tan, it, it does give me a nice glowy golden look to my skin color, which is nice. Oh, lovely. Um, so it is quite good, but. I mean, it's a lot as well for the bed sheets and all that. It's yeah. very messy. <laughs> oh, wow. Interesting. Interesting <laughs> what my what question my daughter was going to ask you. That's amazing. So as you know, this podcast is called Now I Know. Um, and we have a closing question. And obviously this episode is called Now I Know about the bodybuilding mindset. So Ekam, you know, you know so much about the fitness industry. What would you go back and tell younger Ekam when you were getting frustrated with the different methods of weight loss? I think there's two things I would say. The first being invest in a coach because I started my journey alone and it was fine, but I made a lot of mistakes along the way and my pro my journey was so much slower because of it. And to be honest, I've, like coaches need coaches. I've been with my bodybuilding coach since 2020 and I've never left her because she knows my body. She works with me. Having a coach who is constantly working on themselves to become more knowledge, more experienced, is going to continuously learn, is then going to help you continuously learn. And there's always room to improve. I think a lot of people think, right, that's it, I'm done. I know everything, I'm going to go. But if you can always learn, there are so many methods to this journey and this process. It's not just about losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. And find the right coach for you. And it's really hard. It might take a bit of time. You might play with a few different coaches to see who works for you. But when you find the right coach for you, it's going to expand your experience, expand your growth, your knowledge, because your coach is going to want the best for you. So firstly, invest in a coach. Honestly, the best thing. I have worked with different coaches and that's what's helped me become the best coach now with how I treat my clients, the work ethic I have, all of that. And secondly, don't believe everything you see on social media. <laughs> because... 
being in this industry now, I see a lot. And it's in, the, a question I ask a lot of clients when they start with me in their forms is, show me what you want to look like. Like, what's your body goals? And they'll be showing me all these influencers on social media that have like, like gym girls with like perfect bodies. And it's a sense of false hope right. because you don't know what they've done to get there. You don't know whether they've taken certain steroids, taken fat burners, done X, Y, Z, or even just had like a very long history of training. So they're like obviously way advanced. So I think it's very easy to look on social media and think, why am I not looking like that? That girl's had a 12 week journey and she looks much better than me. Like why why is mine not as good? Mm. You don't know what it took in those 12 weeks for her to get there. She could have hated the journey completely Mm. and end up putting the weight back on three months later. It's really easy to compare on social media. And I I see it myself. I see my own clients look at other transformations from my own clients and say, oh, this client of yours did really well. Like I didn't get that good results. And I said, well, you've been eating off plan every weekend, you know, and this client's actually given 100%. Yeah. Um, So as easy as it is, don't believe everything you see on social media is honestly you versus you just work on being a better version of you from who you were three months ago six months ago to a year ago as long as you see that self-development and growth each month each few months every year that's all that matters it's you versus you i love that you versus you because all we do is isn't it compare ourselves to others especially in bodybuilding i (laughs) <laughs> the hardest thing about bodybuilding is nowadays with social media, you can actually see who's going to be next to you on stage beforehand because everyone's tagging the federations, everyone's posting. So even for me, some of the shows that I'm going to be doing, I actually know who's going to be standing next to me. So imagine how hard that is to know this girl's next to me and to think maybe actually, yeah, she does she does look more developed and better. Yeah. And knowing that potentially you may not even yeah. win now and you haven't even done this show yet. It's hard. It's really yeah. easy to get in your head. And But for me, all I said to myself was the sport is subjective and I just want to improve my package from two years ago. I want to do better in where I was two years ago and that's all that matters. It's so easy to compare. I, I know it. I've seen it. I've been in it. Um, but when I just focus on myself, I am truly happier. Like, even if it means coming off social media, if even if it means deactivating, like some bodybuilders come off Instagram for like two, three weeks before their show because they know how much it messes with their head leading yeah. up to show. So whatever you need to do to put yourself in a better headspace, do that. And they say comparison is a thief of joy, right? Just bear that in mind. Yeah, and that's with everything, isn't it? You need to be grateful in this life. Yeah, definitely. I'm constantly like when I can, I mean, if I'm driving or walking up, try to name things I'm grateful for in that current moment. Because if you can take a minute to be grateful, you just instantly lift up your mood. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gratitude is, is an amazing thing. Dr. Rina talks a lot about that yeah. as well, uh, like different tools for uh, feeling good. But good luck with your competition. Thank you. Um, are there, like there's probably not a pe- lot of uh, South Asian women competing or is that just... I I mean, when I first started in 2020, I think I was the only like colored person in my show. Um, But I am seeing it more now since then. I know a few female Indian bodybuilders, which I want to do a podcast with some of them and sit down with them. And it's great to see and I love it. And I've even tried to convince one of my clients to compete because she's got the great genetics and mindset for it. Um, So it's definitely opening the door. The doors are more open now for more Asian women. And I always love to push it. Yeah. But definitely it isn't something that is as common still. And that's why I I love to compete because I love to open that door more and more and more. Yeah. But sis needs a break now. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm hanging it up now. (laughs) But you will be the first of many. Yeah. So well done. No, really thank amazing. you so much. So best of luck with the competition. Thank you. For the audience listening, you versus you. Yes. And let everyone know how they can connect with you. So on my Instagram, my handle is body by Ikem, B-O-D-Y-B-Y-E-K-M. Same on TikTok. And I'll we'll leave it in the Put bio. the show notes, absolutely. Yep. Awesome. But thank you so much for thank coming you. in today. So good luck with everything. And to the audience, thank you for listening. Thank you.